Welcome to episode 68 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes. Now, at the end of each of these podcasts, I usually say the same things. And one of the things I say is that if you have your own story to tell, then please get in contact and I give you all the contact details. And occasionally people do get in contact and that is exactly what Tony Lenehan did. He lives in the English Midlands and last autumn, September, October time, he set off on a trip in and around southern Europe. And in this episode of the podcast, we're going to hear from Tony. Now, Tony has a dual life. He's a cycle tourist, but he's also an active travel coordinator for a local council. So actually, we use the opportunity of also talking about the situation in Britain, in England, when it comes to active travel. So here we go. Episode 68, Tony Lenehan, active travel and cycling in Southern Europe. My name is Tony Lenahan. I am a keen cyclist. I currently work within the cycling world uh, in the uh, in the world of active travel. I'm a sustainable travel coordinator for um, a local authority in the Midlands. I've been doing that for about nine years now. Prior to that, actually, I was a police officer and I retired still fairly young. And because I'd always been a keen cyclist and I had a, another job in me when I retired, um, I tried to find a career that fitted my hobby as it were. So I trained and became a bikeability instructor, um, worked for a while training primary school children in bikeability, which was excellent, and then moved to a couple of other different roles within the sustainable travel team. And now I'm involved in behavior change to encourage people to uh, cycle and walk more, use public transport and car sharing. Behavior change is not quite as Orwellian as it sounds, it's just merely just trying to <laughs> trying to uh, give people who want to make a change in travelling habits the the ability and the opportunity to um, to do so. We're not anti-car, but we're just kind of pro-choice, and we know that we know that 65-ish percent of all car journeys in this country are five miles or less, and we know that the vast majority of those journeys are made with one person in the car only. So we try and chip away at that group of people to say that if you could swap out some of those journeys some of the time you're going to make a big difference and we and we use kind of established behavior change science principles really we work on a principle called combi which stands for capability opportunity and motivation combi and if you take that principle and overlay it with someone wanting to cycle to work say which is what we do a lot of we look at people's capability to do that their opportunity to do that and their motivation to do that so you might have someone who has the opportunity to cycle to work because his shifts work and his home setup works. They've got the motivation to cycle to work, but they haven't got the capability because they haven't got a bike, for instance, or they're worried about punctures and that kind of stuff. So we go in at the capability level and we address that particular barrier, completes the circle and off they go. And, and the same will apply. Some people might be able to cycle to work, but their shifts at work don't fit. So sometimes we'll go in and work with an employer to say, look, if you could perhaps tweak this person's shifts so he can start and finish half an hour later that would allow him to do his school run and whatever it is before then he can cycle into work and when i started in active travel especially working with businesses it was pretty niche we would go into a business typically and we would be dealing with the caretaker or the facilities people the people that were put in the bike sheds or maybe would put in a locker or a shower or whatever because they were the people that dealt with people who wanted to cycle to work now we are dealing with companies at board level uh, senior HR people because they see active travel as as a, a tool towards employee well-being, mindfulness. We know that people who cycle to work are happier and healthier and more productive, and that is a you know that's an HR win. So we are dealing uh, now increasingly at board level with with uh, with companies who really see the benefits of active travel. So it's really changed. The landscape has changed a lot since I started. It's a really um, I won't say it's without its frustrations because it is very frustrating at times, but it also is an area of work where you can really make a difference and, and, and score some some real wins for people, which is which is really quite rewarding. So, so yeah, that's what I do. I think you've answered most of the questions I was going to ask there anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're actually going to be talking about a trip that you made last year yeah. in Southern Europe. 
But just before we get to that, uh, we are recording this on the 15th of March, 2023, and my clock says 12.15. And on one of my screens here, I've got the uh, the budget. Mm. Jeremy Hunt is about to stand up and give his budget. Now, yeah. you work in active travel, and we were talking about this before we started recording. There has just been a big cut in the funding available for active travel. Is that going to have a massive impact, do you think? It remains to be seen. There has been a massive cut. Going back one step, active travel has never been better funded than it is now. Again, when I started, it was a bit of a Cinderella service and it was seen as a nice thing to do, but not really an essential. And over the years, that's moved on and to the point where we are, you know, we have been better funded than we ever have been before. Part of that was this was a funding commitment of about £600 million, I think, over the next couple of years. Prior to this, we've had the gear change booklet from the Johnson government, written by Andrew Gilligan. It was a really well-received, well-researched, well-written document um, that covers all sorts of uh, transport planning policy areas. LTN 120, the design guides to standardise infrastructure and, and cycle infrastructure. Um, and all that was funded and the formation of Active Travel England. So all these things have been done. Active Travel England is a statutory body, a statutory consultees on things like planning applications and um, developments and that kind of stuff. So a lot's been done with the funding that we've had. The funding budget cut you're talking about was, I think, a bit unexpected. Lots of ongoing projects probably will be a bit uh, nervous about how they're going to continue going forward. But I think... It only came out last week, and I think people are still trying to understand the understand the, the implications of it. It may well be it's not quite as harsh as reported. It may well be there's some kind of government manipulation of figures that actually the funding is 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 less the funding cut is less harsh than it than it seems. But it's probably a bit early to say. So it's a shame because it has really been well funded, and it looked like there were some good years ahead in terms of funding. And when the various prime ministers came and went during the summer last year, we were concerned that with each change of prime minister, there might be a change in the funding arrangements. And we kind of held our breath with Liz Truss, held our breath with Rishi Sunak, and now this has happened. So I don't know, we're a public service and you know we rely on central funding. So that's a long answer to your question, but it, we don't know. But inevitably, inevitably, I think there's going to be an impact which is a real shame because it seems to be counterintuitive. You know, I, I listened to one of your previous interviews with someone called Beth Ward who talks about the bike being the answer to every mm. every every problem. And, you know, there's an old saying, isn't it? If the bicycle was invented today, it would be seen as the solution, not the problem. And if you think about all the crises that we're facing at the minute, you know, obesity and public health and congestion and air quality and climate, you know, an increase in cycling attacks all of those crises. You know, so to cut back on measures that encourage people to do that seems really counterintuitive. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But we are at the whim of um, government money. So we'll have to see. And when you visit places like not just the Netherlands and Belgium and Denmark, which are clearly the countries that are up there in terms of providing facilities on the ground for active travel, but even you know places like France and Germany and and Spain, like you're going to talk about in a few minutes, do you not just want to tear your hair out of the fact that, you know, they're doing stuff that is way beyond what we're doing here in Britain? Doesn't it just make you want to weep? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's the word I was going to use. I mean, I do an annual road biking tour with some friends to Holland, and we, I think you were there uh, where we normally go in Zealand, up the coast, across the dams and stuff. And I mean, Holland is... In a way, Holland is is so amazing. It's too amazing to compare to here because we're we're too different. But you know, we we go on the ferry and we come back to Hull, and every year we roll off the ferry in Hull and think, God, <laughs> we're back. You can tell we're back back onto the A sixty, whatever it is. But even if you go to places like France or Spain, you know, you go to an urban area in in Spain, for example, and you can really see the difference that the the money that they're clearly pumping in, and they they see it as a an asset for their communities, for their regions, for their towns, for their cities. Whereas here, it's just seen as a, a as a kind of an inconvenience almost for that weird group of people who happen to want to get on a bike. That's exactly right, Andrew. And it, and it, and it isn't always about money. I mean, they do. There's undoubtedly money being spent, 
But I think it's more of an attitude. You know, cyclists over there aren't seen as an inconvenience. People generally see, well, if, if there's three people on a bike in front of me, that's three less cars on the road. So actually, I'm in a car and I'm going to get around quicker. People don't seem to have this irrational kind of um, antipathy towards cyclists that they do here. And I do think it was changing. You know, when I talked to you about, you know, the, the, the what I've seen over the time I've been doing active travel, you know, it was a lot more niche and odd before. And, you know, and it's easy to be downhearted about here. But you go to London, say, you know, the city of London last week released some figures. You know, there's now more bikes in the city of London during the day than there are cars. That's an amazing achievement. London itself, with all the segregated cycle lanes and stuff, you know, they're not they're they're racking up millions of trips by bikes. I'm a you know I'm a firm believer in segregation now, and there's, so there's a critical mass effect where the more people are out there using it, the more normal it becomes, the more normalised driver behaviour around cyclists becomes, and it's a kind of virtuous circle. But it is about an attitude, you know, and like I found when I travelled on trains and stuff when I was on my trip and on ferries. You're just not seen as an inconvenience. People just accommodate you, you know, and, you know, it's not, it's nothing unusual. And I, and I don't know what it is here. I don't know whether it's, I mean, I don't, I don't suspect that abroad they have the same kind of anti-cycling sentiment whipped upon the media, the, the war against motorists, the war between, you know, the, the terminology is, is, is strange. And I don't know whether it's jealousy or, you know, people see a cyclist whizzing past them in a traffic queue and they wish they were on a bike. And I just don't know. But I do, you know, you, you're right to say you do come back and you really see the contrast. And for the first week or two after a trip, when you come back, it, it, you can be really down in the dumps about it. That transition from from Rotterdam to Hull is just stark and it is so... So, so, so depressing. Do you think that uh, when the likes of Boris Johnson, I'm no great fan of his, to say the least, but when he stood up in Parliament and talked about a golden age of cycling, was it just another example of them gaslighting, in in this case, cyclists? Possibly. And, you know, there's a long list of topics that they have gaslit us about. But all I'd say is he did match it with some money. You know, so, you know, undeniably, he, I mean, the gear change booklet was was excellent it was really well received had some really kind of high quality credible contributions these are very simple straightforward things little quick wins you could do as a planner or as a highway engineer to kind of make cyclist life easier and they were, and they were very commonsensical in an unusually commonsensical way for, you know for government publications and of course you know i work in behavior change what they would call soft measures so we're all about encouraging and motivating and incentivizing people to get out and you can guess what the first barrier is. I don't feel safe. You know, we have parents who, you know, will go and train a 10-year-old in bikeability and they'll do fantastic and they'll ride on the road and all the rest of it. And then they'll go home to mum and dad and they'll say, well, that's great, but there's no way you're going out on the road again. Forget that. I work in a school and, and not one kid. In You know, we've got nearly 2,000 children in the school and not one child in that school. And we're a community comprehensive you know, there are plenty of kids who, who live within cycling distance, but not one child cycles to school. It's crazy, isn't it? It's just crazy. There seems to be this God-given right now. We have a schools officer in our team, you know, and she and she works hard all the time to try and break this down. But there seems to be this God-given right that people um, have in no other area of their life, really. They don't insist they park right outside a shop. They don't insist that they park right outside the football ground but they insist they park right outside the school gates and it causes such such problems. And we do clear zone schemes where we try and uh, ban cars from coming into the area around the school. And But the pushback we have from parents is incredible. You can't, you know, it's dangerous for my child to walk. You know, there's ice on the pavement, there's this, there's that. You know, I've got to be able to drop them off outside. And, and it got really, really, at one particular school, got really kind of uh, angry politicians local councillors were involved <laughs> thinking this is just to keep cars a street away from the school you know it benefits everybody you know air quality goes up and all the rest of it it shouldn't it shouldn't be so difficult perhaps active travel should be funded through the nhs rather than funded through a separate pot of cash yeah i mean it's a good idea and, and you know and there is the, the, these pilot schemes called social prescribing where uh, GPs and um, other kind of uh, medical services can prescribe things like cycling lessons, walking, walking groups. You know, I think Chris Boardman has got some stat 
it's something like for every pound you invest in cycling infrastructure, you save ten pounds on the NHS going down the line. So, you know, you think well, you have you have NHS funded programs for people to stop smoking, to cut down on alcohol. Why not NHS program to invest in this because it's preventative. It's a it's a straightforward preventative measure that down the line is going to save a load of cash. So it's yeah, it's a good idea. But it takes that leap of thinking, faith, doesn't it, to do it? And um, we seem to be stuck in a bit of a loop. And you, you, know, you talk about other European countries. I suspect they're a bit more enlightened in that, and they see that. And that's perhaps where they invest the money, as well as putting in a bike lane. You know, they they see it uh, downstream the savings. So um, you know, perhaps that's what happens. Right. Okay. Well, that that is fascinating. I think there's probably scope for a podcast in itself, talking about all that kind of stuff. But uh, we are going to move on, uh, and we're going to talk about your trip last September, October, from Bilbao to Athens, uh, which you named B to A, as opposed to A to B. It involved 10 ferries. Uh, You were staying in a mixture of hotels, hostels, campsites. First question, how did you come up with that route? What was particular about that route? Well, I wanted to go across Europe. I wanted to go on ferries. I wanted to go east because of the time of year I was going, September and October. I wanted to be trying to hold on to as much of the nice weather as possible. If I, if I toyed, I toyed with the idea of flying out or getting out as far east as I could and cycling home, but thinking, well, if I'm September October, I'm going to be cycling back into the the worsening weather, the you know, back into the shorter days and colder days if I come back towards home. So I wanted to go east for the weather. I'd done quite a lot of research about uh, cycling around the coasts because the, an alternative would have been just to start in Bilbao, go around the Mediterranean coast, South of France coast, the Italian coast, and go that way. But I, I'd done some quite a lot of reading. I remember reading one of your things about the um, about the coast around Perpignan and and that part of the the Mediterranean being very hilly, not a bit busy. So I really wanted to cut across and I wanted to use ferries as well because I've, I've cycled all before with ferries. I just really like the idea of ferries. It's a childish thing, really. But I really like the idea of just rolling on onto a ferry and making distance. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm completely with you. I'm completely with you on the ferry thing. I'm completely with you there because the uh, it's just the perfect opportunity to do nothing for an enforced period of time. I think they're, they're great. They are great. And they're, and they're a lot cheaper in Europe than they are here. Overnight, they're an accommodation as well, so that you've got somewhere to sleep. You make some good distance. They're quite romantic, I think, ferries, and they're quite, you know, you really feel like you're traveling and you, you, you're, you're away if, you, if you're rolling onto a ferry. I like the logistical challenge of booking them and, and getting onto them. So I wanted to use ferries. So this kind, of, this kind of route was born out of that, really. So obviously the first uh, leg, which was, a, was a, the longest ferry, which was Portsmouth to Bilbao, um, I wanted to start in Spain. Because that was the furthest I could. I wanted to start on a ferry, and Spain was the furthest I could get on a ferry, basically from the UK. So, so I started in Bilbao, and then cycled, ferried across, cycled across Spain, kind of in the shadow of the Pyrenees. Yeah, you were just to the just to the south of the the Pyrenees, weren't you? Yeah, just to the south. When I originally planned this, it was originally going to be in May and June um, of the year before, but because of COVID and lockdown and, and all the rest of it, it got put back. But in May and June, and I'd considered going into the Pyrenees, perhaps crossing the crossing over the Pyrenees or something. But I'd read that a lot of the, the passes in the Pyrenees don't even open till the first of June because of snow and stuff. And I thought, well, that's not really what I'm what I'm into. So I planned the route to stay on the Spanish side, and then when the trip was postponed to September October, I kept that route. So yeah, so the south, the Spanish side of the Pyrenees to Barcelona, then an overnight ferry from Barcelona across to Sardinia. Sardinia, north to south, pretty much, um, in a straight line um, on the island. And then a ferry from the southern tip of Sardinia across to Palermo, Sicily. And then Sicily across the Messina Straits into southern Italy. And then once in southern Italy, I kind of took a northward turn and cycled across to Brindisi. Originally, I'd intended to go to Bari and across to Albania. But I changed my mind about that on the trip and went to Brindisi and went across to Igmanitsa in Greece. So if so, I've cut out Albania and gone straight to Greece further south and then all the way down the Greek coast, that Greek Peloponnese coast and across to uh, across to Athens. And the 
the ferries which started with this enormous Brittany ferries, brand new LPG powered, enormous thing that took me to Bilbao. As I went across, you know, further and further east, the ferries got smaller and smaller and smaller to <laughs> to the extent where my very last ferry, which was into Piraeus, the port of Athens, was hardly anything more than a, a pleasure cruiser. It was uh, it was tiny. So. I quite like the way that the ferries decreased in size as, as I went across. So, um, so yeah, that was the kind of bare that was the kind of bare idea for the route. You should have ended up on a I don't know a rowing boat or something across a across a, <laughs> yeah. a little pond in uh, in Athens. Why did you? I'm looking actually. I'm looking at your map here. Uh, this presumably must have been prepared before you went, because you, this shows you going to Albania. Why did you cut out the Albania bit? Uh, it was prepared before I went. A couple of reasons really about Albania. I didn't really enjoy, I didn't really decide to change until I got to southern Italy. I wasn't really enjoying southern Italy. I really enjoyed Spain. Sardinia was lovely. Sicily was amazing. Southern Italy felt a bit functional. You know, I had to get across it and I had some, a couple of issues with dogs, as everyone does. And I found myself in a few industrial type areas and I wasn't really enjoying it. And I was keen to kind of get through it in a way. I'd been reading about Albania and I met someone. I'd, I'd read about Albania that the roads were terrible. The driving was terrible. Outside of the towns, it wasn't particularly friendly. I made the mistake of reading the security advice on the Foreign Office website, which said, beware, don't get into any traffic disputes because everybody's armed. I thought, oh, crikey. I'd heard about dogs again. And... I met actually a cyclist after I made the decision. I met I met someone on the road who got his leg completely bandaged up, and he he had a dog bite in Albania, which kind of vindicated my decision a bit. So it was an easy route amendment to make because all it meant was that I went to I was going to go to to Bari across to I can't remember the name of the port in Albania, but instead I just went to Brindisi and went across to Greece further south. So it was a decision made on the fly, really, but mainly it was because. I wasn't enjoying Southern Italy too much. I wanted a change. I wasn't sure that Albania would give me that much of a change. And I thought, well, I don't really want to be bouncing down awful roads, being close past, you know, and all the rest of it. Yeah, well, I, I was there in 2013 and the roads the roads were terrible. The driving was terrible, very fast. I remember being these black Mercedes, apparently the Germans sell their uh, second-hand Mercedes off to the Albanians, or they did at the time. It wasn't the great place to cycle, although it was, compared to my preconceptions of what Albania would be like, it was actually a lot better. But there were a couple of instances for me where I did have, you know, interactions with people, and I thought, oh, you know, that, that doesn't make me feel 100% comfortable. But uh, I was only there for two or three days. Uh, Tirana was an interesting place to visit. But, uh, yeah... Am I am I assuming from what you've just said that you didn't have all these ferries booked in advance, and the fact that you could you just kind of booked them when you were approaching? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So one of the things I did before I um before I left was I downloaded a lot of apps onto my phone and registered with them with card details and stuff. So um, including the apps for the ferry companies, the Italian train companies, Spanish train companies. So they were already on my phone in a folder, which made it very easy to book these things. I had a rough idea that the, the starting point going across Spain, I had to be in Sardinia by a certain date because my son came out and <clears throat> spent the week in Sardinia with me traveling. So for his flights and his schedule, I had to be in Sardinia by a certain date. So I did, in fact, book that ferry beforehand just to give me a bit of motivation and also to get it booked because I knew I had to be on a particular ferry to get across Sardinia. But after that... I just booked probably two days in advance when I knew how I was getting on. Never found a problem with availability. I'd done a bit of price checking because you know here how the closer you get to the date, the prices go up. And I was a bit bothered about that thinking, well, if I could have booked it two weeks ago and saved a load of money. But actually with the ferries, there didn't seem to be any price movement at all. I used a, 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 an Italian shipping line called Grimaldi Lines. They were the ones that went from Spain to Sardinia and Sardinia to Sicily. They've got a really nice app. Their prices didn't change. And even when I was booking, I think the uh, Sardinia one, I only booked it the day before, I think, on the app and, and away you went. So it was really straightforward. Everything's done electronically. You get a QR code on your phone and, and away you go. So I deliberately didn't want to book the ferries in advance because 
I didn't want to be so structured. You know, I wanted to have the ability to, to change if I, if, I, if I wanted to. And that's what that was vindicated with the Albania decision because if I had booked the Bari to Albania ferry, I would have taken it. So, and I perhaps would have enjoyed it. So, and that principle of booking stuff on the fly extended to the trains, to um, accommodation, and everything was just done. Accommodation was pretty much done on the day. Um, I'd get to about lunchtime, work out where I was going to be, and then book it on the day. And the same with trains. I had the, I had the apps on my phone, and away you go. So it was, it was really, really straightforward to do it to do it that way. Now, the bike that you were using, um, there's a bit on your website that I was reading earlier, and it says the following. The bike started life as a cyclocross bike made by Dolan, but with ribble markings on it. You bought it from eBay for £350. You've converted it from drops to flat handlebars, which, having done that myself, that leads to various problems. But you had your hand-built wheels from Spa Cycles in Harrogate. They cost more than the bike. And you had Marathon Plus tyres. That sounds like a kind of a, almost a Heath Robinson bike. Yeah, that's a good way. <laughs> that's a good way of describing it. I would also describe it as a bit like Trigger's Broom. There was nothing really original left on it. It was, it was a cyclocross bike. I bought it off eBay. Absolutely bomb-proof frame. I'm not too sure about the markings on it. And over a, over a probably a year or so, I switched it over to what I would, you know, it would be an ideal spec for me. The wheels, you know, I'm I'm a six foot one, fairly heavy rider with kit as well. I wanted some strong wheels, um, so the so the wheels are important to me. So I got those hand built, uh, the mecca of cycle touring, spa cycles, and switched everything over. Were you never tempted to have a complete bespoke bike built for you know it's a significant trip yeah i was tempted actually I, I, I was i was very tempted but then i kept on thinking well i've got this bike there's nothing to suggest it won't last you know i thought well if i spend a lot of money on a new bike for the trip that's less money to spend when i'm out there there's nothing wrong with this bike and i quite like the the challenge of of, of doing it on a bike that's that's got a few miles under its belt already and i have to say the bike was absolutely impeccable i had a couple of broken spokes which i think was unavoidable and um, which was sorted and apart from a puncture as i got to athens after all the time it was absolutely impeccable there's no i had no issues with it at all so you know i was pleased i was pleased that the old bike carried me through you know i think if i did another one then i might consider a, a bespoke a bespoke one for sure but um you know, I wasn't really too far from civilization at any, t- any one time. If something had gone wrong with it, I was always probably within reach of, of, of repair. So that wasn't too much of a problem. But I, re- I really enjoyed the idea of taking taking my old bike, my old commuter, shopping bike and all the rest of it and uh, switching it over and taking it on a big trip. So, yeah. Had you done any cycle touring before this? Yeah, a bit. Um, I did. Um, so I, I do a, an annual trip with some friends to Holland, done some other cycle touring in Holland. A couple of years ago, I went to Spain and did Malaga to Valencia. I flew to Malaga, cycled to Valencia, and flew home. So I've done some bits and pieces, and I'd, and I've had, you know, people always say they think they've got a book in them. Everyone's got at least one book in them. Well, I always thought I've, I've always got one tour in me. One, you know, I really want to do this. I really want to want to do a longer tour and see how it goes. The longest tour I've done prior to this was a week. The Spanish one was a week. I really wanted to do an extended tour to see how it went. So. So I'd got a bit of experience. I'd, I'd flown with the bike. I'd sorted stuff out with the bike abroad and that kind of stuff. So I wasn't a complete novice, but I was a complete novice in terms of the time I was going to be away for this tour. And that had its own kind of challenges. But in terms of actual cycling, I'd done a bit, yeah. yeah. Did you use the same bicycle for that trip from Malaga to Valencia? I did, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's a well-travelled eBay bike. <laughs> It's, uh, I mean, there's an argument to say if it is an old bike and, it, and, and something goes wrong with it, well, you know, apart from the sentimental effect, you'd not, you've not really lost much. You know, if, if you're going to spend a couple of thousand pounds on a brand new, whatever it is, and something goes wrong, then it's more, it's more impactful. So, but yeah, but that bike's been all over the place with me. Yeah. On again on your website, you say the plan was for it to be eight weeks, but from my reckoning, looking at your Strava profiles. You set off on the 30th of August and you finished on the 14th of October, which is about six weeks, six, seven weeks. Is that difference mainly due to that Albania decision? Yeah, pretty much. I think Albania uh, saved me about a week. 
a week or so. I'd set off slightly earlier in August than I didn't know whether I'd be it would be the first week in September before I um, managed to get away, but because of the ferry timings, I managed to get onto a ferry on the 30th of August. Yeah, I'd allowed eight weeks. Eight, I'd got eight weeks off work, effectively. and I needed to be back at work on the 1st of November. So I'd allowed eight weeks. I managed to get away a little bit earlier, save myself some time in Albania. So it worked out at about just under seven weeks. I think I was away, start to finish, six and a half weeks, something like that. So, But Albania was the main time saver. Was that an easy thing to do to get eight weeks off? And what was the reaction of family and friends and colleagues? Very supportive. Work was, well, it wasn't a challenge. We've, we've got a, a career break policy here. I mean, going away cycling for eight weeks doesn't really fit one of the categories for a career break, but there's an overarching well being reason. So if you think you need to go away from work for a while for, for your own well being, so that's what I played on. <laughs> what, what What is their criteria for a good? career break I'm, I'm intrigued what 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 do you have to do well you can have unpaid leave for caring uh, education if you're if you're ill yourself i think i think they're the three main criteria and then there's an overarching one for employee well-being you know if you you know so i said look i've been i've been in full-time work you know for nearly 40 years now i need a break so <laughs> and they were fine they were fine to be fair i'm in the cycling game so it, it would have been hard for them to justify say no probably but it still took you know i set out to apply and jump through a few hoops well it, it's interesting isn't it the the budget i don't think he's announced yet a, a reversal on that funding cut but anyway but one of the reasons why he's doing what he's doing today is to get more and more people into the workforce apparently there are 1.1 million vacancies in in britain at the moment and that there's a lot of people who later on in their careers he wants to in attract back into the workforce and I suppose doing what your employer has done and being very flexible in terms of longer periods of time off that in itself might encourage more people to go back into the workforce if they know that you know because they are a keen cyclist or walker or whatever that they can take a period of two three months off and then return to work afterwards. Absolutely. It's, it's an enlightened policy and, you know, everybody's got different commitments and, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to do this financially apart from anything else, but with children and stuff, when the children were younger, I wouldn't have been able to do this at that time. But now obviously at this stage of life, things have changed and I've got the opportunity to do it. So to have an employer that backs it is excellent because depending on how committed I was to doing it, you could even have people who would leave if they weren't shown the flexibility to do it so it is nice for them to be enlightened and, and they are as a local authority to be fair they are fairly flexible and fairly switched on with that kind of stuff there's a whole range of flexible working stuff goes on and uh, they tend to support people to do that so so basically the trip is spain then you take a ferry to sardinia and then you're cycling through italy albeit with a ferry between sardinia and sicily and another one obviously to get back onto the mainland so you've had spain italy and then Greece. Could you talk about perhaps the differences and the the good points, the bad points of cycling in each of those three countries? They were differences that I noticed really. I mean, I had, I had about two weeks in Spain, a week in Sardinia, a week in Sicily, a week in Southern Italy, and a couple of weeks in Greece. Uh, they were noticeably different really. Spain, was, Spain wasn't really what I expected. Uh, Northern Spain, I've not been to Northern Spain before. Northern Spain reminded me of Brittany or Devon or Cornwall. It was raining for a start when I got there, which was a, a shock to the system when I started. I thought I was on my way for an eight-week sun splashed cycling tour and I got drenched and I realized that you know in all the uh, it was really hilly very green they were growing apples and pears I thought well this isn't a very Mediterranean climate <laughs> this is uh, this is more like you know Britain so I think that's a common perception of northern Spain is that it is just like the Mediterranean but when people get there and this was the case when I first went to northern Spain on a walking holiday about 10, 15 years ago, I was thinking, oh, oh, well, <laughs> hang on, this is more like the Yorkshire Dales than the Mediterranean landscape I was expecting. Very, very different, very green, very beautiful as well. And the um, strangest language as well, lots of X's and K's and V's, the, the language, it was really hard to decipher um, <laughs> there as well. But as I came through, came through and out of the coastal regions of northern Spain, went further inland, it got warmer. And it got drier, um, it got flatter, and 
there were several days when I just found myself cycling through acres and acres and acres of fruit farms. The app I was using took me off the road most of the time. And I was on these kind of agricultural service tracks that went through these, as far as the eye could see, orange groves and fruit trees and that kind of stuff. You know, very, very different part of Spain as I moved across. It was quite, quite remote in that, um, in that central inland region as well. One thing I did notice in Spain was the other cyclists that I saw. I saw the occasional tourist, the occasional cycle tourist. But most, of the, most of the road cyclists were skinny, semi-pro, full kit road bikes. They didn't want to talk to me at all. They were not interested in even saying hello, really. Very kind of wrapped up in their own in their own sport. And it wasn't really until I got across to Sardinia, but then especially Sicily, where I started to encounter other cyclists who were a bit like cyclists here, a bit more wanting to talk and at least say hello as we passed each other on the roadside and that kind of stuff. And the, the age profile got older. They were older people riding in uh, in kits and that kind of stuff. But certainly the Spanish the Spanish crew seemed like they were in perpetual training for the Tour de France, you know, um, or the Vuelta or something. When you, when you came over on the ferry from southern England, when you came over to, to Bilbao, Weren't there lots of cyclists on the ferry? No, not really. There was there was about five of us just queuing to get on. And I was surprised. I mean, I've talked about when I go to Holland on my annual trip, there's there's a whole mini peloton normally getting on that um, hull to Rotterdam ferry. Um, loads of cyclists. But on the Bilbao one, there was there was hardly anybody. Just a couple of guys back bikepacking, one chap riding on his own down to Alicante, I think. And uh, a lady going to ride the Camino de Santiago on an electric bike. But uh, no, there was no massed hordes of cyclists waiting to cycle onto the onto the boat. So I took the cyclists as a metaphor for the country, really. The Spanish cyclists were very stylish, busy doing their own thing. And all the way through to Sicily, they were a lot more friendly and, and uh, a lot more willing, willing to chat. Was that the hilliest part of the entire route to go from Bilbao to Barcelona? I thought it was um, when I started. It was pretty hilly. And in that northern Spanish leg was when I ditched some of my bags. So I'd started off with four panniers, front and back. I'd made the classic mistake of overpacking. And uh, I thought that I'd trimmed it right down, but I hadn't. So after a few days of riding in northern Spain, I thought, this is crazy. I was really struggling to control the front. It felt heavy. It felt slow. It felt unstable. So I stopped at a post office in northern Spain and basically unpacked my two front panniers into a box packaged it up and sent it home that box weighed 12 kilos that's quite a big a big weight to get rid of off the front so so what did you send back so i sent back about a couple of changes of clothes i sent a cooking stove i sent uh, a pillow mainly cooking things really because I'd, I'd got this idea that i'd be cooking the campsite and all the rest of it and then i realized fairly quickly look i'm going to be able to get something to eat either at the campsite or an hour before i'm just not going to be knocking up stuff in my camps in my jet boil every night it's just not worth carrying it around back it came to the uk <laughs> that's a wise decision i i when i cycled on my first trip to southern italy i took cooking equipment with me and i stayed in a hotel in luxembourg and i left it in the hotel room in luxembourg because I, I came to the same conclusion because i thought i'm just not going to use this i do take pretty basic stuff now a small can of gas and a a, a little burner on top and a uh, collapsible pan. And I do use it, but, you know, it is pretty minimal stuff. Do you ever wild camp when you go? No, no. No, and I, and I didn't want to wild camp either because I just thought it was a step too far. I thought, I just don't want to. And, and when I was in Sardinia, I played a game with my lad and we said, look, let's pretend we're wild camping. Let's see if we can find somewhere to, you know, as if we were riding today, where would we wild camp? And we really couldn't find anywhere. You know, and I thought I didn't really want to spend my days always with one eye on where I was going to st- stop that night. I just didn't fancy it. So I think the arguments against wild camping, the more I've thought about it over the years, outweigh the advantages. And I think for for me, the biggest disadvantages is not necessarily finding the places. Although I wouldn't be great at that, and I've on the occasions that I have looked, I've had the same problems as you. But I think you've also got to consider the impact on the environment about what you're doing. Um, there aren't any toilet facilities, presumably where you're um, where you're wild camping, so that's an issue. And you've also got to bear in mind that as cyclists, as people who are travelling, we're not generally staying in top quality hotels. We're 
giving basically money directly to the communities that people cycle through. And one good way of doing that is to stay on a campsite and buy your evening meal, either at a local restaurant or from a local supermarket or a local shop or from the cafe down the road. I think it's a really good way of investing in in the local economy, not in any big way, but cumulatively, thousands of cyclists doing that is more important for the local population than if you're stealth camping every evening and potentially having a negative impact on the environment as well. Although, you know, I know that thousands of people disagree with what I've just said. Yeah, and I think it's horses for courses, but also on a kind of more prosaic level, you know, certainly in Spain when I was I had those days, I mean, I love cycling touring on my own. I've got no problem with, with cycling on my own. I really enjoy that part of it. But it is nice sometimes at the end of the day to go into a shop or, or you know, and just have a you know five minute conversation with someone as you as you as you're buying something or ordering a meal or whatever. And if think if you wild camp, you could easily go for the entire day and not see anyone or speak to anybody, you know. And and for me, that's that's you know a nice part of it at the end of the day, practicing some rubbish language skills on some hapless local, you know, to to get some stuff. So, and also that's the advantage of being on a campsite rather than in a hotel, especially where you're isolated because you've got four walls around you. What was the proportion of going into campsites, hotels, hostels? It changed as I went as I went across. So in, uh, overall, I think I was about 40% camping and about 60% hotels and hostels. What I found was in Spain, there was plenty of places to camp. I camped a lot in Spain. I camped a lot in Sicily and the lower part of southern Italy. But in Sardinia, oh, I camped once, I think. In Greece, I didn't camp at all um, because by the time I got to Greece, it was October for a start. And what I found was that, I mean, I was using booking.com and when I started, I was a bit more uptight about it and I would go onto booking.com and I'd find a place and I'd book it on booking.com and uh, that was that. But then as the trip developed, what I tended to do was the night before I would look at my following day's route, see pretty much where I was going to try and end up, put that into booking.com, identify a few places that looked okay to stay in. And then at lunchtime on that day, assuming stuff was going okay, then I would just pick one. And rather than even book it with booking.com, I just used it as a research tool and just pitched up at the hotels. For a start, I'd always get a cheaper rate than was on booking.com. And secondly, it was cheap anyway because it was kind. Although it wasn't low season, it was lowish. You know, and one night in Greece, I stayed in some. Um, I think it was a five star resort with with pools and that kind of stuff. You know, very nice holiday resort. I think all the chewy guests had gone home for the summer. I had this place pretty much to myself. It was about thirty five euros for the night, and it was tremendous. And that was just a case of just pitching up. So, you know, I do I use Booking dot com for the research and um, and then pitch up, and that was essential also especially in Greece because there weren't any campsites to go to and the couple that I did cycle past were closing up for the season because I was kind of at the end of at the end of the season but Spain and um, Spain and Sicily were well set up and uh, and they were the they were the places I camped I camped most of all. That's a good point about booking.com about using it as a research tool rather than actually using it to book all the time I might actually do that next time. I always, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking when I'm using booking.com, because they don't, there's no box to tick that you're arriving on a bike. You do sometimes mention it in the notes if you think that you might have a problem storing your bike. But if you don't put the fact that you've got a bike on there and you book it and you pay for it, then they're obliged to say, they can't turn you away at the door. Yeah, and it's a good point. However... I never had a problem with the bike. You know, I just would always turn up with a bike. And I mentioned in the blog, I think, I think in Pamplona, I ended up staying in a in a really nice hotel because it was the only one that was left. And in um, Greece as well, it was the deal of the day. It was some boutique hotel, you know. And um, and I mentioned how how nice it was, how with, with such good grace, these people just welcomed me in, you know, never even better than I did. I was, you know, especially in Greece, the day before I'd swum in the sea in my kit when I'd finished the ride and I'd rinsed myself off and all the rest of it, hung the kit out to dry, put it back on the following day. I thought I'd rinsed it out. I hadn't because by the time I got to the hotel at the end of that day, I was absolutely covered in salt. I was like a salt from the sea. I looked a complete and utter 
mess. I must have looked awful. And I turned up at this boutique hotel and this lady checked me in impeccably. Never, I said, can I store my bike? No problem. We'll find a place for you. Never once commented on what I look like or anything like that. And, um, you know, the, these people just don't, don't seem to bat an eyelid. So, you know, I had that in Pamplona, in city hotels. They always find a, They always find a place. And this goes back to your very first question, pretty much, about the difference between here and Europe. You know, here, they'd probably find 10 reasons to, to turn you away, health and safety, you can't put your bike there, blah, blah. And in Europe, they just don't bat an eyelid. They're just, well, yeah, of course, you can store it in the manager's office overnight. He's not in that kind of stuff. So Our roots in Greece, where I set off from Athens back in 2013 and cycled up in the direction of Albania, as I mentioned earlier, and I think our routes were fairly similar, although I did go further inland, back over the bridge. Talking of bridges, well, bridges and tunnels, you had the same problem by the looks of it as I had. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I've read about and I've read about your your experience in that in the same tunnel that Prevetsa, wasn't it? Yes. So what I I didn't know anything about this. It's I'm just looking at it now on the on Google Maps. It is the Ambracian Gulf, is that it? I think that's it. And I got to the southern entrance of the tunnel. You obviously were coming in the other direction. And I read this sign and it said, no bikes. And I thought, oh, God, what am I going to do? Because it is a hell of a detour to go all the way around to continue your journey north. Now, I stood there and thumbed a lift. And eventually, uh, this German chap who was on holiday with his family... Um, he happened to be going somewhere by himself and he had a, a kind of a, not a camper van, but it was a fairly sizable vehicle. And he stopped and we put the bike in the back and he took me through. What was your solution? Well, so I, I, I'd, I'd seen the tunnel on the map and I'd looked on a couple of forums and I thought, well, surely you know, the diversion is so massive. There must be a way through the tunnel because they wouldn't make people, you know, they wouldn't make cyclists do a diversion of about 100 kilometers just for the sake of a one kilometer tunnel, surely. But then, of course, I got there and realized that that was actually the case. So um, someone had said to me that um, you couldn't go through. And I thought, well, you know, that's what you say. I'll be able to get through. Don't worry. So I cycled up to the, the northern end of the tunnel was faced with the same signs that you obviously saw. And then as I was kind of pondering what to do. This, uh, I think he was Swiss. This, I was joined by a, another cycle tourist, and he said that he'd heard that prior to COVID, uh, you could go through, but they stopped. You know, you could kind of wave at the cameras as you went through, and they would they would kind of follow your progress, and it was all fine. And that uh, he had tried to go through about an hour previously, had got about fifty yards, and then the the tunnel loudspeakers blared at him. You know, stop cyclist, stop, stop. And then a a tunnel security man came through and put his bike in the back of this truck. And took him out again. I was thinking, well, why can't they just taken him through? <laughs> well, which direction? The, the the direction he wanted to go? No, no, they took him back to the start. So, uh, you know, so they took the trouble of meeting him, putting his bike in a van, and then taking him back. They want to take him through. So so I deduced that I couldn't really go through. And um, I, was, I thought I could perhaps get through on the footway and or the pavement, and it didn't really work. So I cycled back into Brevetsa, back to the hotel, actually, where I stayed at to kind of see if any, any advice. And they said, well, there's a bus that goes through, and the bus will take your bike. I wasn't too sure about that. So I cycled up to the bus station, but next to the bus station was a taxi rank, and I went and spoke to the taxi drivers. And I think it became a bit of a matter of national pride to see which which taxi driver uh, had the smallest car that my bike could go in. So I got into this tiny car, and this, this taxi driver took me through, kind of shaking his head about how steady the government were. He took me through. As we came out the other side, where the toll booths were, there was a big turning area, typical Greek. So he, he managed to turn his taxi around without having to exit and pay a toll himself. Took my bike out the back. He wouldn't he wouldn't take any money from me. I think it was his kind of uh, symbol of resistance against the government. And uh, he was kind of shaking his head about how stupid it all was that cyclists weren't allowed through on that day. So, But it is, yeah, but it is such a massive diversion around it. You know, I couldn't believe that there was no way for cyclists and probably motorcyclists or, you know, the little scooters to go through, but they they don't seem to cater for it. So I was pretty impressed that day when I managed to managed to avoid that, that's for sure. Yeah, I suppose the alternative might be, I'm just looking now on the map and there is a port on the south, there's a port on the north, so I suppose you could convince somebody to take you across on a little boat, but uh, hmm, who knows? Yeah, and I, I did look at little boats, but they, they, were, they were mainly little fishing boats and... Um, I mean, yeah, I suppose, I suppose you could have done it at, at, at a pinch. It would have felt a bit kind of uh, James Bond doing that, I suppose. 
The the other place where it's quite memorable to cross a, a body of water is at the Corinth Canal. Uh, and again, on your blog, I saw a picture of that wonderful sinking bridge. I remember arriving at that, at the Corinth Canal, thinking, okay, um, how does how the hell does this work? Because I could, I could see a gap. I, I arrived after it had disappeared under the water. And I arrived and I thought, okay, well, there's no swing bridge here. Um, but there was a queue developing. And there were a few boats that went through. And then presumably the alarm went. And then it was almost like uh, something out of the, the final 20 minutes of a James Bond movie, referencing that again. And out of the water appears the, uh, the bridge. Is it really called the bridge? I don't know. The uh, the road that you then, when it all when all the water drains off it, you then uh, cycle or drive across. Quite a memorable thing. It is pretty impressive. And I, I came, I was going the other way, and the bridge was up when I um, when I approached it. And I'd read about the Corinthian uh, the, the Corinthian Canal the night before just to, just to see what it was like, and I, and and I was a bit underwhelmed when I saw it because it, it said that in its heyday it was obviously very very busy, but the the width of it precluded a lot of commercial traffic these days so it's mainly pleasure boats and yachts and that kind of stuff and i kind of i was on it before i realized and i cycled onto the bridge and i saw that it was wood and i saw that it was there's gaps between the planks obviously to let the water out as it as it comes back out of the water and then i was just thinking to myself hmm i must be careful i don't get my front wheel stuck in one of those uh ruts and before i know it i was off <laughs> and it was the only time i came off on the entire trip the bridge keeper came trotting down and said you know it's dangerous you can't ride in here it's dangerous it's dangerous oh you could have told me <laughs> as, as, as i rode past you two minutes ago you could have told me then but um <laughs> so yeah i came off but it was uh it was dry as a bone so it obviously hadn't been underwater for a while but it was pretty treacherous to uh, to ride over when i um when i did it but yeah an impressive um impressive bit of kit really to 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 submerge i've never heard of a bridge that submerges rather than folds up tower bridge style to let people through so it's quite an inventive way of doing it i don't know how deep it goes well it's, i've got a video on my website if you look it up if you if you type in or go back to that that journey you'll find the little video that i took and it shows it uh, disappearing under the water yeah it's quite i would imagine your particular episode of coming off the bike is probably immortalized in cctv coverage somewhere there'll be a there'll be a video of you cycling and coming off your off your bike i did i, I seem to remember because i wanted to get a good view of the corinth canal i then cycled up a hill to a bridge that was spanning the top of the canal and that was more impressive but from that southern end where you've got the uh this sinking bridge it was kind of fairly not underwhelming but it was kind of oh, is that it uh, in the distance it was far more impressive when you went on this little bridge that went uh, above and you saw this great deep cut in the land and there was a br- there was a boat approaching i seem to remember because i think i think some cruise ships can squeeze through nowadays you'd never get these massive cruise ships going through there greece overall was my favorite country it was the, it was a country i had least expectations from and it was the country that i knew least about really and it was the one I enjoyed the most. I think the roads were great, the drivers were great, the food is great for cycle touring. You know, it's you know, it's it's uh, it's good. The weather was lovely, and um, it was really really scenic, and uh, it was just easy. It was easy to be there, and um, I, it was the it was the the, the country that um, surprised me the most. I must say, and it was the I really enjoyed it. Hmm. Did you have a symbolic end point? Uh, did you you know make a point of uh, cycling up the the hill to the Acropolis in order to finish your trip? I was going to, but it was raining on the day I got to Athens and it was the first rain we'd had for for weeks, I think since Spain. So, and I got a puncture and uh, I tried to bodge the puncture and I couldn't, I couldn't. So I had to stop, I had to stop outside some uh, offices near some Roman ruins to fix the puncture. And a, a lady came out and asked me if I was okay. And I explained, and the next thing she came out with a, a tray of tea and biscuits basically for me as I fixed my puncture and that that kind of summed up the end point for me really really nicely you know that this this very nice kind lady brought me tea and biscuits and I was stood next to some Roman ruins while I was fixing the puncture the Acropolis was up in the distance but it was covered in mist and rain because of the day so I thought I'll finish here this is the center of Athens I've made it and uh 
there's nice impressive Roman ruins behind me. It's only two or three thousand years in it, so <laughs> that'll um, that, that'll that'll do me. That'll be the end point for me. So uh, so I fixed the puncture and had some photos at the. I think they were called Agra, the, ro- the ruins of Agra in the in the centre of Athens. So. Did you have any time available in Athens to have a look around when you got there? Or yeah, I had a couple of days. So um, because the logistical problem I had when I got to Athens was how to get home because I hadn't booked a flight yet. Because what I needed to do was find a bike box in Athens to package my bike to get back. I'd got a list of, of bike shops a few days beforehand and emailed a few to say, look, I'm going to be in Athens over this weekend. I need a bike box. I got nowhere really with that. And then as I got into Athens, I cycled past a shop and uh, I saw a Dolan bike outside the shop, actually. I mean, Dolan, a peculiarly British make. You hardly see any, any of them in England, but alone in Greece. And there's a couple of Dolans outside the shop. So I went in and struck gold with this bike shop owner who gave me a bike box could have come back in an hour i did so i managed to get a bike box pretty much just within a few hours of arriving in athens just by by good fortune but that gave me a weekend then because by the time i could then book a flight i couldn't book a flight till the sunday i think and this is friday night so i had a had a, a weekend in athens at the end of it so but i don't know about you but the um it was nice to be there but the tour had finished. Athens was the end point. I never intended to really be a tourist in Athens. It was more my end point. And I was a bit preoccupied then with getting home. And I saw some bits and I, and I had <clears throat> I went to the Acropolis and uh, had a wander around. But I was always slightly just preoccupied with getting the bike packed up, logistics and getting, and getting back. So it was more of an end point for the ride rather than an end point for tourism, if you know what I mean. Mm. Thinking about the whole trip, is there anything that you would have done differently or you would do differently if you were to do it again? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think so, really. I think um, I think I'd probably be more relaxed next time. That's the thing. I felt a bit, not nervous, but I was planning more stuff in the first week, two weeks for sure. And I was over planning. You know, I was being too cautious. I was I had own contingencies for things that would never have happened, really. And uh, once I kind of got rid of that and became a bit more relaxed about places to stay and got into the rhythm of it. I mean, it's a really nice rhythm, isn't it, cycle touring? It's just, you know, you the same thing every day, pretty much. Plan you, you know, you get to a place, have something to eat, plan your following day, go to bed, get up, have breakfast and repeat, you know, and, that, and that's pretty much a nice rhythm to be in. And, and if you can do that, with less worry about other things, then I think it makes it better. So once I relaxed a bit after the first couple of weeks, it became more enjoyable. And I think that would be my takeaway. If I did it again, it would be just to uh, just to go with the flow a bit. You're always going to be able to get out of any spots of difficulty you, you might find yourself in. You know, you're only in Europe. I think if I was going somewhere a bit more, you know, a bit less advanced, it would be different. But you're only in Europe and I think things will be okay. So I think that's what I do. I just relax a little bit more, I think. And do you have plans for another trip? Well, I've got about five trips in my mind, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> no, is a short answer. And I've, I've done this one and it was, uh, it, you know, it had, it had impact on work and home and um, stuff like that. So I'm going to leave it for a bit, but um, I'm just, I'm just traveling vicariously through other people's trips and travels, trips and travels at the moment. My daughter suggested cycling around the world in stages. So that having done this bit to Athens, go back to Athens and then do another leg, fly home, and do the world in stages. So that's kind of sparked a bit of interest. But um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm glad to get. I'm glad to have done this one. I've got it out of my system, and uh, we shall see. We shall see. If people want to have a look at your photos and read in more detail, what's your website? So I wrote a blog on the website, which is www.eurobikebimble.com. Eurobikebimble.com, which pretty much summed up what I was doing, bimbling across Europe at 10 miles an hour. I've, I've subtitled it. So, But if you just Google Eurobike Bimble, then uh, my blog is there. Now, breaking news from the uh, from the budget, I've kept glancing down, and the Chancellor, Mr Hunt, has not announced that uh, he's going to reverse those cuts to active travel. I think that's probably hoping for too much, but he has announced £200 million to fill potholes in presumably England, which uh, which probably will stretch to fill in the potholes in Halifax, where I live. <laughs> so I don't I don't know what the I don't know what the rest of the country is going to do, um, but 
that's that's the one takeaway from the budget. <laughs> it is a bit depressing, isn't it? <laughs> it yeah. is a bit. Well, when you realise that the Dutch are spending, how much did that new underground bike facility in Amsterdam cost? Oh, Was million. it 50 million? Yeah. 100 million? But it's just superb, isn't it? I mean, I mean, and and the, the the gyratory roundabouts they have, and all the infrastructure that goes across. You know, they spend the money, but it's just um, it's just the way it is. And you know, yeah. and we just play at it. Sometimes we just play at it. So, um, yeah. Oh, well, we live in hope. Oh, we live in hope. Okay. Well, on that rather depressing thought, <laughs> um, uh, thank you, and um, good luck on your future travels. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. And a big thank you to Tony for not just taking part, but contacting me in the first place to actually offer his services as an interviewee. If you'd like to do that yourself, then please get in contact. All the contact details can be found at cyclingeurope.org forward slash contact and on social media at Cycling Europe. Please, please, please do get in contact and you never know. You could be on one of these podcasts very soon. So thank you for listening. As always, if you'd like to give a rating or a review for the podcast, then I would encourage you to do so. Please do that on whatever platform you're listening to, Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, etc. And if you'd like to help support the podcast, then you can find all the details as to how to do that at Cycling Europe dot org forward slash support so that's it for episode 68 i'll be back with episode 69 very soon so thanks for listening and happy cycling and i keep forgetting Thank you to Rob Ainsley for the music. Thanks, Rob.